Hello? Oh. Hi, everyone. Hello. We all good? How are we doing? Yeah? I've just been given this mic. I'm just going to run crazy with it. So um, you can all hear me fine, and that's good. I'm John De La Cruz. I'm Associate Professor in Advertising Creative in the School of Journalism and Mass Communications. I'm also the Associate Director there. Um, and I'm also one of the founding members of Honors X. Okay, some of you know who, what Honors X is. Others may not really know so much about it, but we're going to introduce you to what this program is about, okay? Um, but you're all here to hopefully make some changes, right? You want to problem solve, you want to um, just find solutions, right? Because actually, there's a lot of problems out there right now, from climate through to social justice, through to, um, I could keep going on, okay? This was, um, that was a kind of conversation that we had when we started the, um, the idea for this ID8 for Change uh, hackathon. And it started off back in September, I think. Rumor and I, Rumor who is one of the, again, less of the, the person who led the fray for Honors X, we were having a conversation about what we can do really to kind of, less of keep the, the, the mission of Honors X moving in different directions. And we thought, well, there are so many problems, right? There's, um, in terms of the environment, uh, I live in the mountains and we were like so struggling with, um, with the wildfires at the time. And um, there's always some kind of level of anxiety, you know, especially now, this winter with with the horrendous slice of atmospheric rivers we've been having, the mudslides, the flooding. Is it natural? Not really. We all know where it's coming from, right? Um, and then you begin to think about environmental justice as well. Look at the, the town of Pajaro down, um, down in Monterey County. Um, it's devastated. And those people's livelihoods have been devastated as well because those fields are not going to recover pretty soon. Um, and we're looking at, at environments where you have uh, underserved communities, agricultural workers. It's not just a case of, like, of um, their house getting water damage. It's much more than that. Um, so anyway, all of these questions are like, sort of running through this conversation, looking at elder care, because that's something that we all have to consider at some point, looking at um, aspects of, like, sort of you know, our lives generally, violence, division. There are so many. Where do we start? I was going to do a Pecha Kucha on one of them, but I couldn't decide which one to do, actually. So um, I put this idea out there to faculty, and we've got three who are coming in today um, in order to kind of present their problems which they think are, are most pressing for them. And you guys are going to vote on this at the end. Not just you guys, but anybody who's watching out there as well, because we're actually live on, um, on all of our social media accounts right now. Um, you're going to vote for one that you feel is most pressing in your opinion. And that is going to become central to the, uh, the assignment brief that you've been given, the hackathon brief you've been given. You're going to have three weeks to solve this in your teams. And then April 6, you're coming back, and you're going to stand up here, and you're going to present your solutions, OK? Team by team. And ultimately, one of those will be the ultimate winner. How are you going to do it? You're going to do it Pecha Kucha style. And you'll see what Pecha Kucha style is, because our presenters tonight are going to be doing this. Um, honestly, I've done a few of these before, and it's fun, but it's also high pressure, because you do have a time limit. You know, the restrictions are such that you really have to communicate your message very quickly, very succinctly, and very clearly. So you'll get a taste of it. You'll be able to. Uh, to present in that way in three weeks' time as well. Well, you've got spring break in the middle of that as well. Are you guys going to be heading down to, to sunnier climes? I don't think you are. I think you're going to be working on solving this problem, yeah? So I'm going to get off the stage, and we're going to be playing um, a video about Honors X, so you get an idea of what it is. For some of you who are not aware, you may want to consider taking this as a minor next year. Um, and then I'll come back on, I'll tell you a little bit more about the brief, I'll tell you a little bit more about Pecha Kucha, and we'll introduce the first speaker who's going to sort of, um, hit us with, with a problem. Okay? So I'll move out the way right now.
For the Honors X program, I've always kind of had the idea that I've really wanted to have this like golden opportunity to really make an impact on the world. It's definitely a place that's going to push you to think about um, sustainability differently. Of course, from the professional It doesn't necessarily have to be about sustainability, but just new knowledge, a new way of looking at things. So what intrigued me about the Honors X program and why I wanted to apply was the fact that I wanted to be in a community where it was like-minded people trying to make a difference, um, either big or small. So I definitely wanted to be a part of that. I feel like I've learned a lot about SJSU um, in the eyes of sustainability, and I learned a lot about what SJSU is actually doing towards getting um, better programs for sustainability and also like accessibility to learning about sustainability as well. I really used to think of sustainability as this um, really big technology thing that would just come out and um, you know just be this like sweeping change um, but the truth of reality um, is that sustainability is very multifaceted. It's definitely made it a lot more three-dimensional um, instead of just thinking with a bunch of engineers you know about solving one problem we're having to come up with like and think of the actual problems we're trying to solve and then present that as a solution almost like we're running you know our own separate businesses. So having the entrepreneur aspect um, of how like a business can help sustainability and then of course how does it uh, affect the people who, who sustainability is being built for. So the type of work that I see myself doing five to ten years from now Eventually, I do want to get a master's in education, so I would love to work with uh, students and also giving them more access to learning about natural sciences. The one thing I want to learn while in San Jose State is how to create a hydro turbine and put it inside households and for everyday use. I don't know, but I know that Honors X has given me that platform to open my mind and horizons to what's possible. Okay, so just a little taste of there of what Honors X is all about. Um, okay, so are we ready to get creative with all of this? Let me just tell you a little bit more about what the whole program or the whole hackathon is going to be. Now, you all have a link to the Adobe Express page, I take it? Yeah? Okay, so if you look at that Adobe Express page um, that talks a bit about what the hackathon is, it's ever evolving. And what you'll find in there now is the actual brief itself. And that brief is, the, is asking you to take the problem that's going to be the winning idea today and solve it and present it in the best way possible. And so it's totally open, okay? It's, um, you could be designing a product or you could design a website. You could uh, create an advertising campaign. You could maybe think of documentary or movie. You okay? It's totally open. There are no limits. You do whatever it is that you feel is going to be best. The only requirement is that you use one or more of Adobe's Creative Cloud tools in order to present this, okay? In order to make it. So if it's a movie or a documentary, use Premiere Rush or Premiere Pro. You may even think about creating music that's going to sort of, um, help to change minds. Use Audition to record it. Um, poster campaigns, Illustrator, Photoshop, even Adobe Express, right? There are so many different tools there. And I'm sure you all know that we're an Adobe Creative Campus, which means that you all have access, full access, unlimited, to every single Adobe product in Creative Cloud, as long as you're a student at San Jose State. So it's there for you to use. It's there for you to, uh, to take advantage of. And what we'll add to the Express page will be a link to, uh, to signing up for Creative Cloud, just in case you didn't know about this, and you still haven't signed up for it. Use it. It doesn't matter if you're in computer science or if you're in mechanical engineering or in design. 
There are tools there that will help you to visualize your ideas and present them in, in ways which you couldn't do through a Microsoft Word document, okay? So get yourselves creative and think visually and try to find lots of, um, to solve these problems. I said Pecha Kucha before, and what Pecha Kucha is, is, um, is a style of presentation um, Second. Does that make sense? No, I don't think it does, actually. You have 20 seconds per slide to present 20 slides. That's like six minutes or so, okay? That is super fast. Honestly, if you've ever done less of a pitch or a presentation and you rehearse it and you practice it and it's like 10, 20 minutes, that's one thing. Try doing all of that, compressing all of that information, everything you've worked on in three weeks, into just those six minutes. Made even worse by having... 20 slides to run through as well, okay? It's really easy to run over. But we're gonna have a timer. And when that timer goes, you're off the stage, folks. So make sure that you rehearse your presentations as much as solving the problem in the first place, okay? Make sure you do that. Now, only one member of the team will present on April 6th, okay? Each team will have just one presenter. You don't all have to come on stage. There's gonna be Ridiculous. So just one person. So you select the spokesperson for that team. Okay? Is that clear? Yeah. You get it? You guys get it? Yeah? Okay. So before we move on to our first presenter, I want to just give a big shout out to, uh, to three people who have made this happen. Okay? Who helped me to make this happen. I've kept those plates spinning over the last few weeks. Have created the... Um, all of those visuals that you've seen around campus, the posters, the postcards, the express page, have been lots of emailing people when you signed up and so on. They've been absolutely fantastic. First of all, that's, uh, there's Ruma Chopra, who is the director of Honors X, and really through the, we hadn't had those conversations, this wouldn't have been a thing. And then I've got uh, Brian Badiola and Alex Heisen, who have just been amazing. They've lots of taken on this event as a client for DBH Student Advertising Agency in the School of JMC, thinking that we're gonna design a few posters, right? But no, they've been event planning as well. They have really like, have made this, this event come together. So thank you guys, couldn't have done it without you. Really, truly appreciate it. So thank you very much. Okay, so I do actually have things on here. <laughs> which I didn't realize I did. Anyway, uh, thank you for those notes. Um, so, yeah, I want to now move on and introduce us of our first, uh, our first presenter, who is uh, Dr. Wendy Lee. And Dr. Wendy Lee is assistant professor in computer science at San Jose State. She specializes in comparative and high throughput genomics research at the intersection of computer science mathematics and molecular biology. She is dedicated to promoting diversity in STEM through mentorship, networking, and training. And she also serves as a faculty advisor for SJSU Girls Who Code College Loop and the SJSU Bioinformatics Club. And Dr. Lee is concerned about the global problem of plastic, as we all are. Uh, she wants to talk about waste accumulation caused by the widespread use of non-biodegradable plastics. And I'm not going to say any more. I'm going to allow Wen Dr. Wendy Lee to come on stage. Six minutes of your time. Really can us to sell this idea for us, please. Okay. Do I have a... Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm super honored to... Um, give my speech about this problem that we're going to talk about. So um, let's see. This, is, this looks pretty familiar to many of you. We are having so much waste. Um, we're projecting to have, by 2050, increase 70% of solid waste globally, which will come to about 3.4 billion metric tons of waste. And only 20, maybe less than 20% of those waste are actually recycled. 
And that's a big problem because we're going to fill up a lot of landfills. And not only that, a lot of the plastic waste is going to wash down to you know, oceans. And one of the most visible impact of plastic waste And, you know, given that we have, um, well, the slides are a little, so we are going to party sometimes and public events. We see this all the time because it's convenient. We have plastic water bottle everywhere to distribute to everybody so no one is dehydrated. Um, well, not only that, if you go to the supermarket, there are lots of things are in plastic containers and also lined with plastic without even you knowing, like aluminum cans and milk cartons, so much plastic everywhere. In addition to, you know, like for little kids, you want to make sure that their bottles don't break. They have plastic sippy cups, plastic bottles, and even for clothing, we have polyesters and recent study has shown that women's sports bras has high concentration of BPA. Who have heard of BPA before? Most people, right? Because we, after years and years of study, we know that BPA has an impact on human health. And so in 2012, US government actually banned using BPA in water bottles for uh, sippy cups and also milk, you know, the milk bottle for babies. But there are lots of other plastic that has BPA that you are exposed and you and I, you and I are exposed to every day. And what's the cause of BPA to our health? We know that it's caused developmental disorders such as autism and Alzheimer's. In addition to that, it's also known to cause various forms of cancers, including breast and ovarian cancers and prostate cancers. And so you're thinking, well, how does BPA work? BPA is actually mimicking hormones in your body. It binds to cells and receptors in your body that activate cell division. And so that's how we cause, you know, numerous other issues such as infertility, heart disease, high blood pressure, insulin resistant, like uh, um, the type two diabetes. In animal models, and we found that when fruit flies are exposed to BPA when they're in a larvae stage, so they're still developing, they tend to have uh, visual like perception. Uh, problems, they can't really see well, they have learning disability, they can't really understand, you know, when flies rejecting, you know, another fly, they would just keep, you know, going at it. And, and so there are a lot of developmental issues that are found in research and is truly, you know, observed, not just speculating, oh, it's causing autism. So the industry hears that. So like, well, BPA is bad, let's solve that problem let's have something called BPA-free bottles. And we're gonna use reusable bottles, so we're gonna eliminate the use of, you know, those single-use bottle uh, issues. And some label even go all the way out to saying, hey, we are all natural, we're toxic-free, it's BPA-free, it's safe to use to encourage consumers to actually continue to use those bottles, which are supposed to be better, right? But do you know what is the substitute for BPA? What kind of chemical is being used to make BPA free bottle? So, of course, many scientists, including myself, are very curious. And so we know that some of the chemicals being used to replace BPA, such as BPF and BPS, are being studied. And it's known to actually cause, you know, breast cells to divide and turn into tumor. And just like this image is showing, BPF and BPS is, you know, this, the breast uh, tissue cells are changing um, structures. So we see that it is a real issue. Now we think BPA-free is safe, think again. So when you think of a solution for solving an existing problem, maybe more problem is coming. And now that we know, you know, lots of plastic is going to the ocean, UV from sunlight will break down the plastic into microplastic and nanoplastic, where it's easy to absorb by organisms in the ocean, and it go up to the food chain, and eventually gonna impact a lot of organisms, including us. And recently, scientists have also found ways to degrade um, plastic using bacteria. 
But what are the toxin that are coming out from this bacteria for doing this kind of degradation? Nobody really know yet. So it's really up to you to explore what kind of solution you want to put in to solve this real world problem, solving the plastic waste problem. And so with that, I really thank you all for listening and I hope you will um, choose this problem to solve. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, so the second speaker tonight is Deb Kramer. And Deb Kramer is the executive director of uh, Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful. Um, she's the executive director and has been involved with Coyote Creek since 2014. Um, as a community organizer, she's drawn thousands of people to the Coyote Creek cleanup events. You may have gone to those yourselves. She's worked closely with um, different community organizations and agencies, such as Audubon, uh, Open Space Authority, City of San Jose, and Save Our Trails. Professionally, she was project manager in environmentally related fields from water, energy, and waste to now watersheds. Deb is a former board member of Save the Bay and an alumnus of uh, Cal Berkeley with a degree in environmental science. And her favorite. So, Deb, if you'd like to come up on stage, I'll hand it over to you now. I'm very nervous, so just smile and everything will be okay. <laughs> All right. So, I am here to talk about the impacts of homelessness on our waterways. I work on Coyote Creek and that is one of the largest waterways in the area. It is a 64 mile long creek, starts up at Henry Co. Park, and it flows um, through downtown San Jose and out to the bay through Milpitas. Have any of you come out to our cleanups or know where the creek is, or just a few of you? Yes, all right, you know where the creek is, that's great. Um, it's a beautiful place if you just don't look down. And part of the reason I say that is because um, there's just a lot of issues on the ground. And we're trying to help as a community to improve that. And the part of the way we're doing that is through our organization, Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful. So Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful, here, uh, we um, have a, a vision of a healthy Coyote Creek with clean water, abundant wildlife, and people enjoying nature. And our mission, the way we do this, is by mobilizing the community and resources and also by getting participation from everyday people to achieve a healthy Coyote Creek. So how do, how do we put those things together? We always think of it as being connected. Everything is connected. We take action on behalf of the creek. The way we do that is through advocacy or we'll um, actually get people out to pick up trash. Another thing that we do is education. So we want to bring people out to the creek, have them learn about what's really cool there. There's some really neat critters. Um, see how we can connect them to the creek that way. And then we connect people through education. The more you learn about your environment, the more you learn about science, about the water, and how everything is connected, just like having plastics go out to the ocean and degrade through, um, through the sunlight, the more that you can then maybe take action or maybe come out and do some recreational activities. So here you can see some of the things that we do. We take people out to these things called bio blitzes. It's a, a citizen science event where we've had uh, 57 of those just in the last five years. And um, over 1,000 people have joined us. We also started doing murals at the bottom. And those are more permanent opportunities for people to get involved, because we have a paint day as well as putting them together. and then. Um, we have people doing cleanups as well as looking at the wildlife and enjoying it. You can see Ron here saying that his favorite part of the bio blitz was Buckeyes that day. So what I'd like to impress upon you is that having clean water and enjoying it doesn't mix with homelessness. As you can see from this picture here, you've got a camp. What, the things that go with a camp are um, it, uh, lots of trash whether it's their tarps, the sleeping bags, the food, the plastic bags, uh, it all eventually either blows or is deliberately thrown into our waterways. 
This is a big problem because who wants to go and explore on the left if it's filled with feces and lots of dirt? Nobody. So an issue that you need to be aware of is that the number of homeless people in the city of San Jose has increased significantly over the last several years. So in the last um, over 10 years, you can see that the number of homeless people went from 4,000 to now 6,600. It's a very significant increase. And it's not from people moving in to Santa Clara County. There's actually the majority of people who are homeless have come from Santa Clara County. So taking a look at that 6650 that are unhoused, uh, 1,700 are in encampments. And the majority of those are along our waterways. Why waterways, you may ask? Waterways are a place that people live below street level. You can't be seen as easily, which means people won't bother you as much. So since we have over 25% of our homeless people living in camps, these are the kinds of situations people live in. It does not look like a healthy way to live. It is not a healthy way to live. People have diseases from living this way. There's rats that get into the area. In fact, we just um, were out at an area, and the last picture that one of my colleagues took was of a rat. Um, and what we do is we go out there and we try to clean this up. But what we're finding is that as you sit on the Coyote Creek Trail and you look across to the other side, you see the encampments. And then when you're cleaning up, you look in the water and you see the trash accumulating. None of this is sustainable for us to keep getting people food and then having our volunteers go out and clean it up. So here I just want to show you some of the things that we pick up at our cleanups. They're a little different than what you might pick up at a beach. We get car batteries. We get mattresses, we get propane tanks, lots of bike parts, but mostly we get cigarette butts, candy wrappers, plastic, plastic, plastic. And all of this again ends up in our waterways. So there's a, um, they don't mix, right? What I'm trying to press upon you is that the impact of homelessness on our waterways is quite significant. And we can either keep picking up this trash over and over and over again, or we can come up with some solutions where we don't have the trash to pick up and we have these beautiful waterways. That's Coyote Creek. It's clear, you can see the bottom, there's fish. Um, and go hiking along it. Instead of having people come out to do um, the creek cleanups, we can actually have them go and explore and see these little mushrooms which are smaller than my finger. So again, taking a look at the opportunities that are lost from homelessness, you can see what we have as a way to move forward if we have no more homelessness along our waterways. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Deb. That was um, really instructive. And again, as we can see, so these problems are kind of interrelated, right? So we've got um, plastic seem to be at the heart of everything that's that's wrong, really, OK? Um, we do have one final presenter uh, who is literally walking to the building right now. So <laughs> uh, bear with us for a few seconds um, as Dr. Ryan Skinnell um, arrives. And I'll introduce him, actually, a little bit um, as he's getting here. He's Associate Professor of Rhetoric and Writing um, and he's also the writing program administrator in the Department of English and Comparative Literature here at San Jose State. Um, so are any of you in the Department of English? We don't have any English students? OK. So you won't know Dr. Ryan Skinnell um, until now. So um, Dr. Skinnell, he, he, um, he teaches rhetoric and he teaches writing to students who are ranging from pre-baccalaureate fresh people to doctoral candidates. He does run the whole gamut. In 2014, he taught a faculty research seminar in the University of Modern Languages in Islamabad in Pakistan as part of a US State Department public diplomacy program. Uh, his current research focuses on political rhetoric, especially as it relates to authoritarianism, demagoguery, and democracy. He's published six books and more than 100 essays, articles, and reviews about rhetoric, politics, and higher education. 
and his writing has appeared in both academic and popular outlets, including the Washington Post, Salon, and Newsweek. In addition to teaching, writing, and administration, Dr. Skinnell is a founding member of the Right to Vote Project, um, a 2020 to 2021 op-ed project public voices fellow and a faculty expert in political speech, politics and rhetoric here at San Jose State. He's currently writing a book about Adolf Hitler's rhetoric. Okay, so I think we get less of an idea about where Dr. Skinnell's problem may be coming from and it's something that's kind of like so very close to to our lives right now, you know, especially as we're coming up to another election year, the rhetoric that we find lots of in our, in our media uh, platforms, uh, through the news media that we consume. Um, rhetoric is important. The way that lots of the words are formulated, the way that messages are communicated, really do matter. They have an impact, and they have a continued impact on our lives. Division occurs as a result, and so I'm going to lots of... Um, allow Dr. Skinnell to talk about the rise of anti-democratic, neo-fascist, and authoritarian political movements in the US and globally, um, as soon as he comes in with us. So I've prepared you guys already. When he comes in, he'll be launching straight into, oh, he's over there, he's over there. I didn't see you sneaking in, Ryan. <laughs> so we're all mic'd up. Um, I hope that introduction did justice to you. Yeah, more, more than enough. It's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll hand it over to you. All right, okay. thank you. Can you hear me? Is this working? Thank you. I appreciate your patience. Uh, I was teaching a class and I tr for the first time ever. I tried to get them to leave early so that I could get over here and they wanted to talk and stay. I mean, what's that about? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, I am a pro professor of, associate professor of rhetoric and writing, and, and as you ably uh, demonstrated, I write about fascists. I'm working on a book about Nazism. I write about demagoguery. And so the thing that I want to talk about today um, is the erosion of democracy worldwide and the rise of authoritarianism around the world. So in 2022, the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance which is a 34-member organization, put out uh, a report that warned of the erosion of democracy around the world. After World War II, there was a steady increase in democracies and countries moving towards more democratic processes for governance. Beginning in about 2010, we had a significant erosion of democracy around the world. As of uh, 2016, approximately one quarter of the, the world's governments are now identified as authoritarian or authoritarian leaning. Uh, oh, that's supposed to be there. I'm out of, out of sync. Um, that's the cover of the report that I just talked about, right? So now we're supposed to have the dark times, but you can remember it, right? What's happening in a lot of the democratic countries, again, since about 2010, but coming in significant, uh, more, significantly more uh, since 2016, is what's called democratic backsliding, which is democracies that were at one point full democracies have begun to slide towards less democratic processes. The number of countries that are actually healthy, functioning democracies, started shrinking for the first time since World War II. Uh, more than half of the countries, uh, more than half the world's democracies are currently eroding. And in the last 10 years, as I said, authoritarian governments uh, have expanded, now compromising, comprising more than a quarter of governments worldwide. Bad news, the world appears to be broken. In countries like Hungary, China, Brazil, Russia, Ethiopia, and others, world leaders openly argue for abandoning liberal democracy altogether. And in particular, they advocate abandoning democratic values of fairness, tolerance, justice, and equality. Hungary's minister on the left, Viktor Orban, is a prime example. Orban was elected to his position as prime minister, but he openly rejects Western democracy and calls it humiliating and alien to Hungarians. 
He regularly decries the values of equality and justice. And in 2022, he gave a speech claiming that liberal democracy leads to quote unquote race mixing and singled out gender and LGBTQ plus equality as direct threats to his country and his people. Instead, Orban and like-minded uh, autocrats espouse what they call illiberal democracy, in which they reject equality, civil liberties, and the rule of law. They promote authoritarianism, discrimination against immigrants and other minority groups, censorship, and targeted repression of opponents, including journalists and academics. Such threats to democracy are obviously not new. Uh, similar movements were ascendant in the early 20th century in particular, most famously the Italian fascists, the German Nazis, and the Japanese Empire joined forces in the run-up to World War II in part because they all rejected liberal democracy, equality, and human rights as unnatural and corrupting forces. But the Axis powers weren't unique before, during, and after World War II. Authoritarian regimes also thrived at various times in China, North Korea, Russia, Romania, Turkey, Iraq, Libya, Uganda, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, just to name a few. Contrary to popular belief, established democracies have not been immune to powerful anti-democratic movements. The French Croix de Faux and the British Union of Fascists both had significant influence in their respective countries before the Allies declared war on Hitler in 1939. Similar movements proliferated throughout European democracies. Oh, I had a, a slide that was very impressive. You will you'll appreciate it. It'll show up eventually. That's OK. Um, I think I got them all out of order. Um, Attacks on democracy haven't been strictly international either. In 1933, so this is uh, Smedley Butler, Brigadier General Smedley Butler. And in 1933, a group of wealthy, powerful American businessmen plotted to create a fascist veterans organization to overthrow the uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's government. Um, it was called the business plot, and they intended to install Smedley Butler as the dictator of America. Uh, it, was, it was being discussed in some of the highest circles of American government. And in fact, part of the reason that we have um, uh, the New Deal is because of negotiations to keep business plotters out of jail. Uh, in fact, throughout American history, there have been active, often violent, anti-democratic movements including the Ku Klux Klan, Nazi sympathizing America First movement, which is uh, Charles Lindbergh, um, and sovereign citizens movements. Since 2010, oh, there are my fascist leaders. Since 2010, democracy in the United States has been increasingly under attack from forces both inside and outside of the government, ranging from general questions about the efficacy of democracy to violent attacks on democratic institutions and public officials. Calls to abandon constitutional rights, including freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and freedom of the press, are now regularly issued by growing numbers of public figures and elected officials. I went too far. Uh, in 2016, the Economist Intelligence Unit's annual Democracy Index report downgraded the United States from a full democracy to a flawed democracy, so we are also backsliding. The dangers of eroding democracy and rising authoritarianism are clear for individual countries. They're even worse when we take them at large. Things like climate change and refugee crises that need to be fought with large, pe large groups of people and governments. Excuse me, you have one more minute to finish up. I will be done, I promise, yes. You want to hear your question. I'm so engaged by myself um, is the problem. Fires in Brazil. The issue at hand is, how do we begin to revitalize and reinforce democracy, both in the United States and abroad, including fending off authoritarian movements and reestablishing faith in democratic governance? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, 
I was enthralled by that. So, um, but we did have just six minutes, right? So, but thank you. Um, three very different yet interrelated problems. So, I don't know which one I would choose. Um, but it's up to you guys to do this now, right? So, we do have um, a QR code that will take you to the Google form where you guys are going to be voting, okay? Vote for the problem that you would most like to tackle. And then we're going to tot all of those numbers up, and the final problem, the, the top problem, will be the one that you guys will all try to solve. Um, as we're waiting for you to do this, I just want to talk a little bit about um, Adobe Hacks, okay? So, okay, do talk about amongst yourselves, but do listen as well. So I mentioned that you need to be using Adobe tools to make the make your your problems real, uh, your pro solutions real and visualized. Some of you may not be too comfortable by, with using Adobe uh, Adobe products, but that's fine. That's fine. If you follow our Instagram and you go to our Express page regularly, you'll see a number of different hacks, right? Tips and tricks on how to how to use these tools will be appearing for you. And we've got a couple of these to show you as you're kind of making your minds up and deciding and voting. And these hacks introduce you to um, simple ways in which you can make Adobe tools work for you, okay? They're not that complex, and once you get into them, you'll be hooked, I promise you. So, carry on voting, we'll play these hacks, and we'll see what Adobe has to offer you. Hi, so today we're going to show you how to do a building billboard mock-up. And what we have here is just a stock image of a building with the billboard on the side. First thing you're going to want to do is head over to File, Place, Emd, and click on whatever poster you'd like to see on the side of the building. Once it's been placed, you're going to go to the Layers tab on the right-hand corner and right-click on the desired layer and rasterize a layer, which allows you to edit the layer however you'd like to. Then you're going to go ahead and grab the Rectangle Marquee tool and highlight the poster area. Then click Command X, which basically cuts the image from the document. Next, you're going to go to Filter and then Vanishing Point, and this will open up another window where you're allowed to create a perspective um, selected area on the side of the building. Once the area has been selected, a grid will pop up, and then you're going to click Command V, which pastes the poster onto this area, and you can go ahead and drag the poster onto the mock-up area. Once it's been in the area, you're going to click Command T, which allows you to transform the document however you like. Then you can click enter or OK, and there you go. You have your billboard mock-up on the side of a building. For this next mini tutorial, I want to show you all an easy way to create a custom QR code. We're going to start off by loading up our express page and copying the link for it. Let's make a QR code to that. I'm using a MacBook, so I'm going to go ahead and open up my launch pad and go to this neat little app called Shortcuts. It should be available in the latest version of the Mac OS. I already have this open, but you can search for it in the search bar by just typing in QR code. This function can generate a QR code for you by simply pasting the link. We're going to go ahead and paste the link right here into this box. Then at the top of the screen, you're going to hit this little play button to generate the code then we're actually just going to take a screenshot of this. There's technically a share button, but I find this to be one of the easiest ways to do this. With our screenshot saved, we're going to go ahead and find it in our finder. And we're going to open that with Illustrator by right-clicking. Now that we have it open in Illustrator, we're going to go ahead and click on Image Trace at the top. Next to image trace, there is this little rectangle button, and we're going to click on that. Here is where we can edit the QR code to look a little bit better. This QR code actually came out pretty okay, so I went ahead and copied one from online and image traced this one too. This one came out a little bit wobbly with lots of imperfections, 
and too many curvy lines. And then we're going to play around with the threshold settings. Then we're going to go ahead and up our paths to high, corners to more. Noise can kind of go either way. In this case, we're setting it to one. Always, always click on ignore white. Then you go ahead and click expand. This creates it into a vector image. Going back to our original QR code, we can now clean this screenshot up. As you can see, I accidentally left two lines here, but because it got picked up in the image trace, we can just go ahead and delete it. You can go ahead and select this QR code to change the colors. This is the, probably the most fun part you'll have in designing your own custom QR code. Let's go with this blue. Then you can actually select individual elements, such as these squares, and pick a different color for them. And then you can go ahead and select your other squares and use the eyedropper tool to do the same. Let's say you want to have an image in the center. Let's make a QR code for an Instagram link. I went ahead and made this one with the Instagram logo, but it doesn't really look good just like this. The funky little thing about QR codes is that the center isn't actually usually necessary. Now technically you could go around and delete all these various vector points, but actually I'm just going to make a square to have our logo sit on top of. This way it will look nice and it won't compromise the image just in case something does go wrong. If you're going to use a colored block for your logo, be sure to put that in the background of your QR code. With our finished QR code on the canvas, go ahead and file, export that, save as a PNG, and be sure to click on Use Artboards. That way we're using the canvas. And now you can go ahead and add that to any project, such as Adobe Express. And if you want to test out this QR code, go ahead, give it a scan. Thanks for listening. Okay, so, so thank you everybody for voting and for taking the time to, uh, to listen to the hacks. Um, there's more where those came from. So the, those are all going to be added to our Instagram and to, um, uh, to the Express page as well over the next three weeks. So there will always be like new bits to learn. We'll also be adding some links so that you can go over uh, straight to, uh, to tutorials on your Adobe website just so that you can sort of get an idea about how to get started and so on. But what you're wanting to hear is what problem are we going to solve? So the live voting results are in. I don't know what they are, but I'm going to be show. I do know actually what they are. Um, I'm just going to see, wow, overwhelm, oh, uh, yeah, kind of overwhelming, actually. Um, and that is accumulation of plastic waste, Wendy Lee. Okay. So guess that plastics won it. Um, okay, so you guys, you need to be going over to the Express page and looking at the actual brief itself to see what it is that you're supposed to do over the next three weeks exactly, um, and then apply it to uh, Dr. Wendy Lee's um, presentation, which we will put up on the Express page as well, so that you can refresh your memories and you can also make sure that you're going to be on brief, okay? It's pretty open. The results that we're expecting to see in three weeks' time are hopefully going to be like so many and varied. Um, and I know that you guys are already like so thinking about ways in which you can make these, um, these problems go away. We've got a QR code up on here for our Instagram, so make sure that you, um, you do link to that and you kind of like to follow it so that you, know, you can begin to see all of the different updates. Is there anything else I need to add? Any questions I might be able to answer? I'll open it up to you. So any questions you guys might have for me right now? Yeah? After? Um, hmm, that's a good question. That's a really good question. So ultimately, it's an exercise. OK, but there is going to be a winning team. And that winning team, uh, we are uh, sort of talking to um, to some partners to see lots of how we can um, how we can reward you for it. So it's still hanging, but ultimately it is an exercise. You'll have bragging rights. There will be lots of um, there will be swag for you guys to like take home with you. 
Um, but yeah, you want to see the solution come to light, right? Ultimately. So just watch this space. Any other questions? You want to go? Yeah? <laughs> OK. If there aren't any other questions, then we'll call it a wrap. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And don't forget to reach out to any of us uh, through, uh, through Instagram. Um, and honorsx at sjsu.edu. Um, anything that might come up over the next three weeks, just let us know, and we'll try to answer it as best we can. OK? So thank you, everybody, and good night. <laughs>